Are we rolling? We are totally rolling. Are you sure? Okay. Hey, Pete. Hey, Rich. How's it going? I'm doing great, thanks. Hope you are, too. Rich Dana, Pete Balistrieri, here from Special Collections. Pete is the curator of science fiction and popular culture. And a number of years ago, he turned me on to this amazing fanzine that I don't think anybody else has a copy of. So Pete's going to talk about it a little bit today. What do you got, Pete? So, uh, 1945, Dale Tarr, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, it was in 45 exactly, I think there was a little bit earlier, uh, uh, science fiction fan Dale Tarr and his wife Anita began to experiment with the idea of using a, a paint can to create fanzines. And they did the first issue of Science Fiction World uh, using that method, and then they used it. Uh, then they returned from Kentucky to Cincinnati, and Dale Tarr showed it to his friend Charlie Tanner, and they put out a second issue. And then for the third issue, they did a very, very special thing using uh, both the, the tin can method. Uh, what, what we have is Science Fiction World, Volume 1, Number 3, and this cover that you see is homemade uh, blueprint that was done by Charlie Tanner. It's on architectural tissue paper, and then all of the pages on the inside of the fanzine were done with the paint can method using Mimeo stencil, and then if we go a little bit inside, you'll see that all of the headers were done with Hecto. So one fanzine cover done as a blueprint, uh, uh, and then a paint can used to create the Mimeo, and then those pages using the Hectograph process uh, uh, have these beautiful headers. So after they put out this issue, which was number three, uh, they received so many interested uh, 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 inquiries <laughs> that they decided to put out the method. And this is sort of, it's, it's in between number three and number four. So I don't know what you would want to call this. It's, maybe it's 3A or 3B of uh, a science fiction world but it's basically uh, something that they put out to explain the tin can wonder method and there's a nice explanation at the very beginning of, of uh, uh, this particular fanzine that gives the whole method in detail should i go ahead and read that yeah and i'll say this was i don't know five years ago or something and uh pete and i uh, participated in making a fanzine at a science fiction convention and I think it was then that you mentioned to me that you had discovered this thing and for years we've been we've been talking about this so um, this is long overdue that, that that we bring this to the world so Pete why don't you why don't you read what um, Dale Tarr wrote about the tin can wonder okay so this is page one, Mimeo Can by Dale Tarr, The Tin Can Wonder. Last year in Anderson, Indiana, all three years of yearning culminated in a state of mind for which there was only one cure. The cure was an idea, suddenly and fearfully conceived from out of nowhere. To my wife I said, why can't we wrap a stencil around a paint can and mimeograph? When I enlarged on the idea, she couldn't see any reason why it wouldn't work, so we went on a shopping trip. We got a package of stencils and some ink, some paper and thumbtacks, some adhesive tape an inch wide, rented a typewriter, got an empty paint can, gallon size, from a neighbor, and finally, on my wife's suggestion, when we couldn't get regular Mimeo ink pads from a local supplier, a yard of outing flannel. We also had purchased two large sheets of thin cardboard from a stationer. We went home and I cut the cardboard up in two strips, the width of a stencil and long enough to go around the can. I bound it on with the adhesive tape and then, after cutting out a piece of flannel so that when folded it was a trifle less than the size of a stencil, I thumbtacked it to the cardboard. 
We got an issue of SFW together and stenciled it, then fastened the stencils over the ink pad with strips of the adhesive tape. I had put the ink on the pad with an ordinary paintbrush, putting it on smoothly and freely. Then, grabbing what was, grabbing what was now the drum, I proceeded to roll it over the paper. Science fiction world was truly born. The impressions were more legible than many a fan mag had managed on a machine. Later on, when we came back to Cincinnati, I startled Charlie Tanner by showing him Mimeo Can, the poor publisher's pride and joy. Charlie and I put out an issue, then the one with his blueprint cover. Charlie could write an appealing article on home blueprint. That issue, with editorial mention of the duplication method, evoked comment from all over fandom. Several fans thought that an article should be written giving details necessary to the construction for benefit of other aspiring publishers and so on the next page will be listed the necessary essentials and precautions for the proper functioning of your own homemade Mimeo can. Lord help the paper shortage. So what, for people who don't know, what, what does he mean by Lord help the paper shortage? Uh, 1945, uh, the war is still going on, I think, and all through World War II, there's been a paper shortage, paper drives. Uh, famously, Rusty Hevelin's mom saved his pulp collection from the paper drives by putting them in a trunk and putting that trunk in the, uh, up in the rafters of their garage in uh, Los Angeles, uh, in Riverside. Uh, and yeah. And so that's one of the reasons that there are so few of these fanzines still in existence? It's, pro pro it, partly. it's definitely one of them. Uh, I think there was probably more paper in the U.S. Uh, they were definitely using really cheap paper, but there was probably more paper in the U.S. than other places. I know that during the war, uh, Forrest Ackerman sent paper to England to uh, Futurian War Digest. Uh, and they thanked for him. Fans in yeah. England to make fanzines, so to make fanzines cool. with, and they thanked him profusely uh, for sending two reams of paper, which they then turned into uh, Futurian War Digest. Before you go on, though, one other thing I notice he refers to him as fan mags. Was that term fanzine not being used? I think in '45 it was still probably going back and forth. Uh, fanzine was that phrase that gets recommended by uh, Lewis Russell or Rush Chauvenet. And Rush Chauvenet uh, in his zine says, fan mags is not euphonious, it doesn't come off the tongue well enough. And he suggests that fanzines is a better uh, way to describe. And that gets picked up and it, naturally it takes time. And so I think pe some people still kept saying fan mags probably for a while. But the transition to fanzine becomes, I think, almost total you know, after a really short time. That's great. And of course, it was sent directly uh, to Rusty Hevlin to the 3rd Street address in Riverside, California. And you can see that this was uh, sent from their Cummington, Kentucky address. And uh, Now I noticed that um, he uh, in the article, he worked on it with his wife, but he doesn't mention her name. Right. We were curious about that. Right, and and it turns out, I'm pretty sure, that uh, uh, Dale's wife's name was Anita. And we get that information through the very well-known science fiction author, Paul DeFilippo, who did some extraordinary legwork and found Dale's obituary and, and uh, uh, many thanks. Uh, to Paul for that information, and yeah, uh, Anita and and Dale work out this method together, uh, like I was reading, and they put out the very first issue that way themselves. So she's got to have a lot of credit because I think that she helped a lot with the idea of how this could all be put together and, and how it would work, and and was there when they did it the first time. So uh, 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 lots of uh, uh, props to Anita. So uh, I could go ahead and I could read the whole method, but I think that you have gone ahead for us and actually uh, produced uh, some uh, pages using this method. Yeah, so 
I'm going to try and duplicate Dale Tarr's method uh, from my studio at a top secret location. And um, are you aware of any other examples uh, of fanzines that were printed? With I'm the not. Can method? I'm not. It would be uh, a really interesting uh, topic for some research to, to find out if other um, if who, other fanzine right. makers use this technique. Right, who picked this up, who decided that was uh, something worth trying. Uh, I know that the uh, uh, first, I think, four or, or so uh, copies of uh, uh, Science Fiction World are on FanHack. Oh, and right. and yeah. I think that uh, I've been playing around with these and, and showing them to people for so long that we haven't digitized them yet, so they're not among the Hevelin uh, digitized fanzines in our uh, digital library here at University of Iowa. But we are going to um, scan the, the instructions and make those available Absolutely. on the digital library, right? Right. And then uh, uh, eventually uh, Science Fiction World, the, the, the sort of deluxe uh, one that they did we'll get that digitized as well but like I say you can see it in its entirety uh, on the FANAC site I don't think that you would find the instructions this sort of volume 1 3a or volume 1 3.5 uh, I haven't seen that on the FANAC site I don't know who else has this uh, we're just very lucky to have it as always because uh, uh, James Rusty Hevelin uh, was just one amazing collector. So, uh, so next we have to find uh, if Charles Tanner ever actually uh, did the article um, that Dale mentioned here on the the home blueprint method because right. that's really beautiful. I'm going to do some digging and and see if maybe at some point uh, uh, Charlie Tanner did describe his blueprint method. It's an amazing uh, looking cover for a homemade blueprint. So yeah, I'll do some digging and see if we can't find out about that. Cool. All right. Here I go. I'm at the studio. I'm cutting out the flannel. I'm going to make the ink pad out of this. Uh, I got it at the big box store for about $4 a yard. And you can see you can get a lot of um, ink pads out of one yard. Next, I'm making the cardboard. Uh, strips. I'm using some scrap so I'm joining two pieces together instead of two long strips. I'll have four short strips but I'm just going to make sure and offset the tape joints so that I don't get any more of a bulge than I absolutely have to. Now I'm putting on the ink pad and adding some more masking tape. Now I'm going to start making my stencil. If you've never seen a mimeograph stencil before, it's made from very light and very tough paper. Uh, a Japanese paper called Gompi was the first paper that was used to make it and it's impregnated with a waxy resin so that when you draw or type on it, it pushes the resin away leaving the fibers of the paper in place so that the ink can flow through wherever you've made a mark. Here I'm using a ballpoint stylus as described by Dale Tarr. They are still available for printmakers and they're also used in nail salons interestingly enough. Here I'm putting the stencil onto the can with more tape, masking tape, duct tape, anything will work. Now I'm putting on the ink. You can see it soaking into the flannel pretty fast. But on the first go I didn't want to have too much ink going through the stencil. So I went a little bit light. And here's my first test print and you can see it's too light. I immediately decided I needed a lot more ink. So I went for it and I added a whole bunch more ink. I got it nice and inky and here we go second print looking better looking better already and there you go we've got a completed print I kept going and I kept messing around with it 
and I added a little more ink, I added a little less ink, and in the end I was able to get a pretty decent print using Dale Tarr's Tin Can Wonder. It's actually really cool. It's really cheap and it's really simple and I can see why fans got so excited about it uh, when it first came out because it was a way that people could make their own fanzines with almost no investment and no machine. So I'd like to uh, just read one last thing uh, uh, that uh, Rich has discovered. On page two of uh, uh, volume one, number three, Dale Tarr's method of mimeographing, like the atomic bomb, is either a boon to fandom or a curse greater than any yet discovered. For it may shower the country with mimeoed mags put out by enthusiastic Lemurians, not yet out of kindergarten. Briefly, the method consists of using a large tin can wrapped in cardboard and inked flannel and attaching it to a stencil with adhesive tape. It is rolled over the sheet by hand, and there you are. <laughs>